All right, let's dive in. Today we're going old school, time traveling back to 1994. Oh, wow. With this quality roadmap PDF. Talk about a blast from the past, right? You've yeah. got that big presentation on quality improvement coming up. Right. And it might even be older than you are. Uh huh. But no worries, we'll bring those vintage insights into the present. Awesome. Because, you know, you mentioned feeling a little stuck with those vague definitions of quality. It's true. It's true. It's like, what does it even mean? Everyone throws it around. Oh, right. Exactly. So this roadmap seems to really tackle that head on. It does. It jumps right into breaking down quality into eight clear attributes, mm. like a checklist almost. Ooh, I love a checklist. Give it to me. Okay. So we've got performance, features, reliability, conformance, durability, serviceability, aesthetics. Okay. Let me write this down. Hold on. Performance, features, reliability, conformance. Okay. Got it. Durability, serviceability, aesthetics, and perceived quality. Okay, so eight things to check off for quality. Makes sense. It's a really good framework. So let's test it out. My trusty old coffee maker. Okay. What makes it high quality based on this list? Well, let's see. Performance is probably the most straightforward. It better make a good cup of coffee, right? Well, yeah, that's the whole point. Right. Then you've got features. Maybe it grinds the beans, too, or has a fancy timer. Ooh, yeah, the extras. Mine doesn't grind beans. Sadly. Right, but those can add value. Then reliability, it works consistently every morning, not just sometimes. Which thankfully mine does most of the time. And conformance. Yeah. So that's more about meeting standards, safety tests, all that good stuff. So it's not going to like explode when I plug it in. <laughs> Hopefully not. That's the idea. Then we get into durability. It should last, not fall apart after a year. Speaking of which, I've had mine for a while. Maybe too long. Maybe it's due for an upgrade soon. Don't tell my coffee maker that. But yeah, okay. Durability. What was next? Serviceability, right? Yes. So if it does break, it's not a nightmare to get fixed. Uh, that's a good point because some things are just done for if they break. Exactly. You got to factor that in. Okay. And then uh, aesthetics, right? That one's pretty obvious. Exactly how it looks, the design, if it's visually appealing. Mine is purely functional, not winning any design awards. Okay. So then the last one, perceived quality. That's interesting. Right. So that's all about the customer's feelings, their experience. It's that wow factor. Exactly. Nice. That this is a quality product feeling. Which, honestly, sometimes you just know it when you see it or use it in this case. It really is. And often it's built on all those other attributes we talked about. They all add up to that overall impression. Cool. So basically we could analyze anything this way. Absolutely. Products, cool. services, Depends. you name it find the strengths and weaknesses, see where it lands on the quality spectrum. Exactly. And I think for your presentation, that's a great way to make it more concrete. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Give people a framework they can actually use. Exactly. So we've talked about defining quality, but you also mentioned how those practices themselves have changed over time, right? Well, absolutely. I mean, we're looking at a 1994 document here. Right. So it's a time capsule. It really is. And back then, the big thing was total quality management or TQM. TQM. Sounds intense. Okay, so TQM, total quality management. What's the deal with that? So it was like the thing back then. Really? Oh, yeah. It was all about making quality everyone's job, not just a separate department. Interesting. So not just an afterthought. Right. It was about building a culture of continuous improvement. Okay. I like where this is going. Continuous improvement. Got it. Yeah. So everyone from the top down was involved and responsible for quality. So instead of fixing problems later, you bake it into every step. Exactly. It was a big deal. Well, it sounds like a pretty big deal. It really was. Companies were competing globally and TQM, it was supposed to be the answer, you know? Make things better, happier customers, all that good stuff. Exactly. Efficiency, the whole package. But how does this blast from the past connect to today? What about now? Well, things have evolved, right? But those core ideas from TQM, they're still relevant. Really? Yeah. Continuous improvement, customer focus, empowering everyone. Those ideas stuck around. So it's like TQM was the seed. In a way, yeah. It influenced a lot of the approaches we see now, like Lean, Six Sigma. Okay, so it's like it evolved. And exactly. It's like TQM laid the groundwork. That's super interesting. Okay, so we've got TQM, but my notes also mentioned quality gurus. Ah, uh, yes. These pioneers of quality. The big names for sure. And it just so happens our 1994 PDF mentions them too. Of course. You can't talk about quality without the gurus. So who are we starting with? Who's first on our list? Well, we've got to start with Deming. W. Edwards Deming. Oh, yeah. I've heard of him. What did he say again? 
Well, he had his 14 points for management. They were yeah. a big deal. 14 points. That's a lot to remember. It is a lot. Oh. But they're hugely influential. And a lot of them tie into this idea of quality culture, which you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Building that culture is something I'm really interested in. Well, one of Deming's points was about driving out fear. Driving out fear? What does that mean exactly? So he believed that people do their best work when they're not afraid to make mistakes, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Being able to speak up without being afraid. Exactly. If people are scared to point out problems, those problems never get fixed. They just get swept under the rug. Exactly. And that's not good for anyone. Mm. And another point that ties into this is breaking down barriers. Okay. Breaking down barriers. What kind of barriers are we talking about? Departmental barriers, mostly. Yeah. You know those silos that can pop up in organizations? Oh, those silos. Everyone loves a silo. No. He was big on teamwork and collaboration, you know? Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Exactly. And that's still so relevant today. Yeah. And, of course, we can't forget about continuous learning. Always be learning. That's what they always say. Deming was a big believer in that. Always improving, always striving to be better. It's like leveling up in a video game, but for your career. There you go. I like that. And speaking of important figures, we can't forget Joseph Duran. Okay, another guru. Tell me more. What did he do? He had this concept called the Quality Trilogy. Ooh, a trilogy. Sounds fancy. Does it involve hobbits? <laughs> no hobbits. But it is a pretty big deal. It breaks down quality management into three parts. Planning, control, and improvement. Planning, control, improvement. Sounds kind of catchy. Right. So you plan for quality up front, then control the process to stay on track. And then, of course, you're always improving. Always improving. There's that phrase again. It's a common theme for a reason. Yeah. Whether it's Deming or Duran, that constant striving for better is key. Makes sense to me. Okay, so we've got Deming, Duran... Who else? Well, there's one more guru we should talk about, Philip Crosby. Philip Crosby. All right. What did he say? Anything juicy? Oh, he's known for a pretty bold statement. Zero defects. Zero defects. Okay, that's aiming high. But is that even possible? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Right. It sounds good, but in the real world. Right. Crosby, though, he believed in changing how we think about defects. Instead of accepting some level of failure, he wanted to create a culture where everyone believed zero defects was possible. It's like having a growth mindset, but for quality. Exactly. Believing in that potential for perfection. I can see how that could be motivating, but also maybe a little intimidating. You're right. Not everyone loved his approach. I can imagine. For some people, it could feel like a lot of pressure. Exactly. And that's an important point to remember. Striving for perfection can sometimes have downsides. It's about finding that balance, right? Exactly. Aim high, but also be realistic. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Defining quality, those big historical shifts, the gurus. We've done a whirlwind tour of quality thinking. But there's more, right? Our PDF isn't just big ideas. It's got practical stuff too, like tools and techniques. Oh yeah, it's full of them. So ready to get into the nitty gritty, the actual tools. Let's do it. Time to break out the vintage toolkit. Right, we're talking flowcharts, fishbone diagrams, Pareto charts. It's a visual problem solver's dream. Love it. Though I gotta admit, some of this stuff feels a little, I don't know, analog in the age of all things digital. You'd be surprised. Those visual tools, they're still incredibly relevant. Really? Why is that? Because at their core, they're all about understanding how things work. Processes, systems. Right. And sometimes, you know, getting it down visually Seeing those flows and connections, it just clicks. Makes sense. It's like sometimes words aren't enough. You got to see it. Exactly. Plus, they're great for communication. So walk me through it. What were these tools all about? And do people actually still use them? Oh, absolutely. Take flowcharts, for example. It's like a roadmap of a process. Okay, so you see each step laid out. Exactly. Whether it's manufacturing, software development, whatever. Yeah. Being able to visualize that flow, mm -hmm. it helps you spot the bottlenecks, the inefficiencies. Find the weak link in the chain. Exactly or those opportunities for improvement. Because you can see the whole picture all at once. Exactly. Now, then you've got the fishbone diagram, sometimes called a cause and effect diagram. Oh, yeah, I've used those before. They're great for brainstorming sessions, especially yeah. when you're trying to figure out the root cause of a problem. Right, because sometimes it's not obvious. Exactly. You know, you map out all the potential causes, like branches on a fishbone. Could be equipment, human error, suppliers. Anything, really. Right. And then you can see how they might be contributing to that central problem. Like a big puzzle. In a way, it is. Yeah. And it helps everyone get on the same page, too. Love it. Okay. What about Pareto charts? Ah, uh, 
Those are all about priorities. Mm, like that 80-20 rule I've heard about. Exactly. Focus on the 20% of causes that are driving 80% of the problems. Don't sweat the small stuff, basically. Right. Focus on the big wins first. Makes sense. But here's the thing that's been bugging me while looking at all this. It's not all L charts and grass, is it? Our PDF, it talks a lot about teamwork, leadership, culture. You're picking up on something really important there. Because at the end of the day, quality isn't just about tools, is it? It's about people. Exactly. You can have the best tools in the world, but without the right team, the right culture. It's not going to happen. Exactly. Uh, and that takes us back to those themes we talked about earlier. Open communication, collaboration, empowering everyone. It all ties together, doesn't it? It really does. It's all connected. So we've gone from a vintage PDF to like the future of quality in one conversation. We've covered a lot of ground. We've talked definitions, history, those big name gurus. The tools and techniques. And of course, the human side of it all. Can't forget that. So, listeners, if you're prepping for a quality presentation or just curious about this stuff... You've got this. Take notes, because this is good stuff. And on that note, until next time, happy qualitying, everyone. Mm -hmm.